We now begin a new chapter. And just to keep encouraging you as we go chapter by chapter through books like Kings, which seem very um, repetitive. It doesn't seem like new king, but same old behavior. I think that there's a reason for that. The writer is setting us up for the ultimate rule of Jesus Christ. So 2 Timothy 3.16 and 17 says, All Scripture is God-breathed and profitable. For correction, for reproof, for training in righteousness. So everything we're reading in the Bible has value for us. <clears throat> so we have to remember, it's all God-breathed, and it is profitable in some way. So let's open 2 Kings. We're in chapter 8. Uh, let's look at the outline real quick and then we'll pray. In the first six verses, you'll have King Jehoram restoring the Shunammites' land. And then 8, 7 through 15, Elisha predicts evil from Hazael. 8, 16 through 23, another Jehoram reigns in Judah. You got to keep up with the names of these kings because sometimes you'll have the... <clears throat> A couple of kings using the same name. 8, 24 through 29, uh, Ahaziah succeeds Jehoram in Judah. So it'll take us to the southern kingdom. The focus is mostly on the, in, in the north, in Samaria, and all the problems after the split. But it'll take you to the south as well sometimes and show you what's going on there. <clears throat> so let's pray. Father in heaven, we thank you, Lord, for this opportunity to open your word and, and grow in it and see your plan for history unfold. And Lord, it just makes us pant even more for your Savior, our Savior, Jesus Christ, the, the Savior you will send for us, the one who will rule a perfect kingdom on David's throne one day in the future. So Lord, we anticipate that greatly. We see in the present time that no matter how good man is, he's not worthy to rule like you will rule. And so, Father, we anticipate the kingdom rule of Jesus Christ and cannot wait for his righteous rule on this earth. So, Lord, we'll just commit our time to you in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, <clears throat> let's look at the uh, first two verses. It says, Now Elisha spoke to the woman whose son he had restored to life, saying, Arise and go with your, your household and sojourn wherever you can sojourn. For the Lord is called a famine, and it will even come on the land for seven years. So the woman arose and did according to the word of the man of God. This is Elisha the prophet. And she went with her household and sojourned in the land of the Philistines seven years. So this woman whose son Elisha restored to life was the one back in 2 Kings. Remember that? 2 Kings 4, the one that was raised to life. So Elisha warns this same woman later here of seven years of famine that's coming from God as judgment on the land. So she moves to Philistia, the land of the Philistines. So she has to leave the land and go to a foreign land to find relief from the famine. Does that remind you of anybody? How about Naomi in the book of Ruth? So God had obviously sent famine as judgment on Israel in the period of the judges, so Naomi goes to Moab to find relief from the famine, and then in the first chapter, she hears that the Lord had restored food in her native land, so she returns and ends up coming back with Ruth, and we know the story from there. So what do you do when you see famine in Scripture? A red flag goes up, and somewhere in Torah, they have been violating God. I just keep calling it covenant violation. So the Mosaic covenant to govern Israel has been violated by the nation. And God promised if they disobeyed him that famine would come. Deuteronomy eleven sixteen and 17. I'm backing up. You could go to Deuteronomy 28 and Leviticus 26. But Deuteronomy eleven sixteen and 17 says, Beware that your hearts are not deceived so that you do not turn away and serve other gods and worship them. So is idolatry a problem in the time of 2 Kings? It is. It's still a problem. It's going to be the central problem that the Jews will go into the Babylonian captivity. They're not listening to the prophets. 
They're not listening to Elijah. They're not listening to Elisha. They're not listening to Hosea in the north or Amos, another prophet to the north. So if they do worship other gods, verse 17 says, or the anger of the Lord will be kindled against you and he'll shut up the heavens so that there will be no rain and the ground will not yield its fruit and you will perish quickly from the good land which the Lord God has given you. So verse 3 <clears throat> At the end of the seven years, the woman returned from the land of the Philistines. So, boy, that jumps seven years ahead. And she went out to appeal to the king for her house and for her field. So she leaves her land and all of her property, and now she's going to appeal to the king for the, her property back. Which property left in Israel temporarily was held in trust by the king until it was reclaimed by the legal owner. You can see this in the Torah. So the woman, after seven years of famine returns and seeks to claim her property. So verse 4, Now the king, this would be Joram, was talking with Gehazi, the servant of the man of God. Remember, we keep seeing Gehazi, the servant of Elisha, saying, Please relate to me all the great things that Elisha has done. As he was relating to the king how he had restored to life the one who was dead, behold, the woman whose son was restored to life appealed to the king for her house and for her field, and Gehazi said, My Lord, O king, this is the woman, and this is her son, whom Elisha restored to life. What do you keep seeing in this verse? From death restored to life. Death restored to life. I think you're going to see this pattern in the Bible. Um, even Jesus, in his parable of the prodigal son, uses it when the son leaves and goes to a foreign land. He comes back and he says, my son has been restored to life. He was dead. He's alive again. So you, you see this, this pattern of death to life. Here it was a physical death. He died and it was restored to physical life. So King Joram asked Gehazi for a recount of the great deeds of Elisha. Gehazi brings up how Elisha restored the woman's son to life, namely brought him back after death. So when the king asked the woman, she related it to him. So now he goes to her for the story. So the king appointed for her a certain officer saying, Restore all that was hers and all the produce of the field from the day she left the land until now. So looks like he's going to follow the law and give her her property. So the king asked the woman about the testimony of Gehazi. And after hearing it, he agrees to restore everything after the seven years of famine. And again, there's this constant reminder of God who restores life and blessing because this woman is now blessed. She has her son back. She also has her land back. And isn't this basically the very same God who's using Elisha working through this situation, even Gehazi? Isn't it the same God who can restore Israel to life? But it requires their repentance back, which you're not seeing uh, in Second Kings. So where you see the words restore to life that we just saw repeated three times, the Hebrew word is chaya. Chay is the word for life in Hebrew. The verb chaya uh, is used to restore to life. And it was found in Torah, central chapter, Deuteronomy 30, 19 and 20. Israel's repentance, shuved or return to God would be a restoration to life. Isaiah 55, 3 uses it. Ezekiel 18, 32 uh, Ezekiel 37, 14. So the theology of God restoring Israel to life as a nation is very important. And you just see these little microcosms of events that happen in history showing that God is the one who's ultimately able to restore the whole nation. But the nation's in covenant violation in our, in our, in our text. So then Elisha, <clears throat> verse 7, he goes to Damascus. Kind of shifts story a little here. Now Ben-Hadad, king of Aram, was sick, and it was told him, saying, The man of God has come here. The king said to Hazael, so look what he tells him to do. Hey, take a gift in your hand and go to, and meet the man of God and inquire of the Lord by him, saying, Will I recover from the sickness? So Elisha goes to Damascus, which is the capital city of Aram, where the king of Aram has taken ill. So he heard that Elisha was nearby and tells Hazael, this lieutenant in his army, to go ask him if he'll recover. Now, obviously, he knows God's prophet 
had done many miracles in his land that had benefited the people. So now he wants to know, am I going to recover from this sickness? So Hazael capitulates. He goes out to meet, meet him and took a gift in his hand. Even every, Now look at what he brings, so quite a bit. Even every kind of good thing of Damascus, 40 camels loads. You know how big a camel is and what they can carry? Uh, the, the, those were large animals that could carry quite a bit. So he takes a lot with him. And he came and stood before him and said, Your son Ben-Hadad, king of Aram, has sent me to you, saying, Will I recover from the sickness? Now, again, calling Ben-Hadad his son didn't mean there was a physical, family, biological relationship. It's a sign of respect. So Elisha said to him, now listen to this comment because it's going to challenge you a little. He says, go say to him, you will surely recover, but the Lord has shown me that you will certainly die. <laughs> Wait a minute. You say to go tell him you'll surely recover, a very dogmatic, strong way in Hebrew saying it'll definitely happen, but the Lord has shown me that you'll certainly die. So you're like, which is it? Well, we'll come to that. So he fixed his gaze steadily on him until he was ashamed. So I think Elijah is now staring at Hazael until he eventually becomes ashamed, probably because Elisha knows his heart. Now, this is a, an amazing story. If we keep reading, we'll see what is actually going to happen and, and why you could say you'll recover, but then at the same time you're going to die. So he fixes his gaze <clears throat> on Hazael until he was ashamed, and then the man of God, which is Elisha, he wept. Hazael said, why does my Lord weep? And he said, because I know the evil that you will do to the sons of Israel. But now, look what he predicts. Your strongholds, or sorry, their strongholds you'll set on fire, and their young men you will kill with a sword. It gets worse. And their little ones you will dash into pieces. And their women who have children, so pregnant women, or even women with little children at their side, you're going to rip up. So, I mean, think of this. He's going he's gonna to just destroy Israel and devastate the people. Then Hazael said, now look what he does. But what is your servant who is but a dog that he should do such a great thing? And Elisha answered, the Lord has shown me that you will be king over Aram. Wow, so now you're going to replace the king who's sick, and then you're going to do these things to Israel. So at first, Elisha tells Hazael, the king of Aram, that he'll recover, fully knowing that he'll actually die, because the Lord has revealed all this to him. When Elisha begins to weep, Hazael asks why with Elisha telling him that the Lord has revealed all this terrible evil that he'll do against Israel. I think Hazael fakes surprise. I think he knows what he's going to do, that he could ever do such a thing. Now, who am I to, but a dog that would do such a thing? So Elisha obviously knows that Hazael will even murder his master in order to replace him as king. So Ben-Hadad could have recovered, but what happened? Hazael is going to kill him and take his place. I think that's the meaning here. If you hadn't have done what you're getting ready to do, and I know you're going to do it because God revealed it, he would have recovered, but you're going to murder this man, take over, and then start attacking God's own people. So when you look at this, you have to admit, this is the perfect knowledge of an omniscient God who knows all future events and outcomes of all of our decisions and action, right? He knows everything. And so the way he reveals it to Elijah, Elisha, well, if I say Elijah versus Elisha one more time, <laughs> uh, he clearly knows all future events and the outcome of all of our decisions, which gives me comfort because God's never surprised by anything that happens to us. He's fully aware in his eternal mind at all times of all things past, present, and future. I do not agree with this view that's been around quite a while, but that God is in the process of learning as history goes on. What an attack on his, his perfections. So verse 14, So he departed from Elisha and returned to his master, and he said to him, What did Elisha say to you? Of course, that's the first thing he wants to know. Am I going to make, this, make it through this or not? And he answered, He told me that you would surely recover. 
<clears throat> true or false? It's a half truth. Yes, you, <laughs> he did say you will recover. But he stops right there in now verse 15. On the following day, he took the cover and dipped it in water and spread it on his face so that he died. And Hazael became king in his place. So just as predicted by God through Elisha the prophet, Hazael kills the king of Aram. He's going to replace him, but he's going to kill him. So he basically takes a wet cloth or possibly the cover that was on his body, puts it in water, and suffocates him with it. So he murders the man. So again, the king would have recovered from his illness, but Hazael murders him and succeeds him as king, just as God revealed it in verse 13. So does God have a purpose for this? Does he know what he's doing? Why didn't he stop this man from killing the king? And allow, why did he allow Hazael to succeed him in power, knowing all the evil he's going to do on his people? Well, that's coming up here in a second. So we, one writer said this, Hazael reigned as king of Aram from 841 to 801 B.C. During the reigns of Joram, Jehu, Jehoahaz in Israel, and Ahaziah and Athaliah, the, that lady we're going to see coming up, and Joash in Judah. So he has a, a reign for some time. And obviously God allowed this evil king to rise to power, to kill the previous king, in order to do all this terrible harm to his own people. All those terrible things we just saw in verse 12. Something that even Elisha wept over. He didn't want to see this. He didn't want this to happen to his people. But wasn't this all part of God's discipline on the people for their idolatry? Yes. And this is where people have a problem with God. How dare he do this? But it's the revelation of God, and he did. And they were worthy of the judgment. So the, the Torah curses warned Israel of the terrible disaster that would come even from the nations if they choose to disobey, disobey God. And eventually, this would come to pass. Go, go jump ahead to 2 Kings 13. This one scripture will help you in this story. Because when we get there, we'll just look back. So remember, Hazael has murdered Ben-Hadad, and now he's replaced him as king, and he's going to do all this evil to Israel. So was God behind it? Yes, he was. So the anger, 2 Kings 13, 3, so the anger of the Lord was kindled against Israel, and he, he, who, who's the pronoun referred to? God, he gave them continually in the hand of Hazael, king of Aram, and into the hand of Ben-Hadad, the son of Hazael. Um, God will use this evil man to punish his own people. And that's how God often did it. He would use a foreign nation to discipline Israel when Israel would not obey him. Didn't this happen at the first advent of Jesus? I mean, Jesus comes to relieve Israel of the evil nation, uh, the nations, of course, Rome is over them at that time, but Israel wouldn't believe in him. It, 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 the majority of the Jews and definitely the religious leaders rejected him. So when Jesus rides in on the donkey at the triumphal entry, now look what he says about the nations and what God is going to use on Israel at that time. Luke 9, go to Luke 19. Let's just read it together. As you're turning there, we know God will use Babylon to punish <clears throat> the Jews. In the, uh, he'll use Assyria in the north. We're going we're gonna to see this in 2 Kings, and then he'll use Babylon in the south. Again, very uh, tough, evil uh, nations, Gentile nations against his own people for their sin. And even when Jesus comes to earth, verse 41 Luke 19.41, when he approached Jerusalem, he saw the city and wept over it. I mean, even Elisha's weeping over the situation. And he said, if you had known this day, even you, the things which make for peace. But now they're hidden from your eyes. For days will come upon you when your enemies will throw up a barricade against you and surround you and hem you in on every side. Who is that going to be? 
that's the Romans in 70 A.D. Jesus is going to die in 30 A.D. on the cross. So 40 years after that, the Romans are coming in. And notice what they'll do, even involving children, just like in Elisha's day. And they'll level you to the ground and your children within you. He highlights even the children, just like he did uh, in 2 Kings. And he will not leave in you one stone upon another, so even the temple's going to be torn down. Because, here it is, disobedience, because you didn't recognize the time of your visitation. So they rejected the ultimate prophet who came from heaven to visit Israel. And that visit was to bring blessing, because in, in the Old Testament, the Hebrew pakad for visitation either is a good visit or a bad visit. For example, when the famine was relieved in Ruth 1, it said God had visited his people to bring food. So that was a good visit. Uh, but sometimes the visitation in the Old Testament is judgment. So the good visitor came, Jesus, but they rejected him. So the time of your visitation that could have been blessing was going to be turned into judgment from the nations. So over and over in Torah, God warned the nations will be used by me to punish you. So now we get to Jehoram's evil reign in Judah. So it's going to shift the scene back to the southern kingdom of Judah and the evil reign of Jehoshaphat's son, Jehoram. Remember, the kingdom divided back in chapter 12 of 1 Kings. And it's, so if there's a division and now there's a problem in the south, there's a problem in the north, we're still awaiting the unification and re uh, restoration under Jesus the Messiah. So as you keep reading this, you're like, oh, wait a minute, all the way back in 1 Kings 12, the kingdom divided, and now we're still having problems in the north and the south after the division, so we're awaiting the unification and restoration under Jesus Christ in the kingdom. Because remember, in Ezekiel 37, what become one? Two sticks are brought together and become one, and that's showing the unity of the north and the south one day in the future. Because in Ezekiel 37, Israel's restored in their land, the famous valley of dry bones and so forth. <clears throat> Excuse me. So 2 Kings 8, 16. Now in the fifth year of Joram, the son of Ahab, king of Israel, Jehoshaphat became, or being the king of Judah, Jehoram, the son of Jehoshaphat, king of Judah, became king. He was 32 years old when he became king, and he reigned eight years in Jerusalem. So uh, one writer said of Jehoram's reign, he said, in the fifth year of Joram of Israel was the year Jehoram began, began to reign as king in Judah alone, 848 B.C. The length of Jehoram's reign, including his co-regency, was 13 years, 853 to 841, while his sole reign was eight years, 848 through 41. Uh, 848 through uh, 841 B.C. And I bring that up because someone online sometimes wants to, he's really trying to do chronology and dates and all of this and how long somebody reigned, and, and that can be very helpful in other discussions. But let's move on to the problem with his rule. It's stated in uh, verse 18, <clears throat> which sounds very redundant. So he, that's Jehoram in the south, Walked in the ways of the kings of Israel. Is this good? No, it never is. Just as the house of Ahab had done. Well, now you know it's bad. Remember Ahab and Jezebel. For the daughter of Ahab became his wife, and he did evil in the sight of the Lord. And how many times does that occur in the Bible? Especially in First and Second Kings. So this daughter of King Ahab was Athaliah whom Jehoram married as part of Jehoshaphat's alliance with Ahab. So these kings in the ancient world would often marry a daughter of a rival king or another king. That's how they ended up with so many wives a lot of times. So Jehoram's godly father, Jehoshaphat, didn't have as strong an influence as Ahab's daughter did. <clears throat> but even so, in either way, isn't he still personally accountable for the way he chose to rule before God? No matter what your situation is, some people say, well, I have really bad parents. Well, then you can walk with Jesus. You can't use that as an excuse. And this man, no matter what the influence was, he could have chosen personally. Even if Jehoshaphat was evil, he could have chosen to follow God. 
there was divine revelation on the importance of doing so. So he would be personally accountable for the way he chose to rule. So in view of all the evil Jehoram did in the southern kingdom, <clears throat> what's God going to do to Judah? He's not going to destroy Judah. So look at verse 19. You have a big however there. <laughs> however, the Lord was not willing to destroy Judah. Why? Why is he not going to do this? It says, for the sake of David, his servant, since he had promised to give him a lamp through him, uh, or give a lamp to him through his sons always. <clears throat> so what covenant is this? A, a highlight of the Davidic covenant. So the reason why God is not going to destroy Judah in the south was because of his covenant with King David all the way back in 2 Samuel 7. So Saul ruled 40 years, then King David, then Solomon, then the kingdom splits, and so now we're way down the road, and God is still remembering his promises. So uh, go back with me to uh, 1 Kings 11. You can see up there on the slide, verse 36, about the lamp. There will always be a lamp before me in Jerusalem, which is what he just said in 2 Kings. But let's review this story. Sometimes you've got to go back and... <clears throat> You ever been watching a movie and you get to the end and say, I need to go back and rewind and see part of that and try to put this together. So we're doing a rewind. But 1 Kings eleven twenty nine, 29, it came about at that time. Now, this is right before the split in 1 Kings 12, when the north and the south split with 10 tribes going north and two staying south. Well, it came about at that time when Jer Jeroboam went out to went out of Jerusalem, and this is Jeroboam who would rule in the north after the kingdom divides in chapter 12, that the prophet Ahijah, the Shilonite, found him on the road. Now Ahijah had clothed himself with a new cloak, and both of them were alone in the field. Then Ahijah took hold of the new cloak which was on him and tore it into 12 pieces. Why do you think 12? 12 tribes of Israel. <clears throat> he said to Jeroboam, take for yourself 10 pieces because Jeroboam is going to rule 10 of the tribes in the north. So take for yourself 10 pieces, and thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, behold, I will tear the kingdom out of the hand of Solomon and give you 10 tribes. So Solomon's in the south. He's one who built the temple in the south in Jerusalem. But now that Jeroboam's going to go north, he'll have 10 kingdoms, or I'm sorry, 10 tribes in the northern kingdom. So I'll tear the kingdom out of the hand of Solomon and give you 10 tribes. But he will have one tribe for the sake of my servant David, and that's Judah, and actually also um, Benjamin. <clears throat> so he'll have one tribe for the sake of my servant David and for the sake of Jerusalem, because the line of the king is going to be in Judah. The city which I have chosen from, for, uh, from all the tribes of Israel. So Jerusalem is an extremely important city in the Bible. It's the city God chose where the temple would be and where the kings would, legitimate kings would rule in the south. And who's actually going to rule in Jerusalem in a temple in the future kingdom? Jesus Christ. I mean, this is where this is going. So if God is revealing this to, to mankind and even the angels read this, what do you think Satan's going to try to do? Destroy Israel. Destroy the city, the holy city. Give God no, nothing to fulfill. So you'll see the Jews always under attack and Satan persecuting Israel, which he'll do mercilessly at the end of history in the seven-year tribulation. But that will fail because God will put an end to that and throw Satan into the abyss for a thousand years and then into the lake of fire after that. <clears throat> I'm going to read verse 31 and then go to 33 again. He said to Jeroboam, take for yourself ten pieces, for thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, behold, I will tear the kingdom out of the hand of Solomon and give you ten tribes, verse 33, because they have forsaken me and have worshipped the Asherah, the goddess of the Sidonians, Chemosh, the god of, of Moab, so all these multiple gods they're worshipping, and Milcom, the god of the sons of Ammon. And they have not walked in my ways, doing what is right in my sight and observing my statutes and my ordinances as his father David did. So verse 34, nevertheless, I will not take the whole kingdom out of his hand, 
but I'll make him ruler all the days of his life for the sake of my servant David, whom I chose, who observed my commandments and my statutes. But I will, in verse 35, I'll take the kingdom from his son's hands and give it to you, even ten tribes. So you have Jeroboam in the south, Rehoboam, I'm sorry, uh, Rehoboam in the south, Jeroboam goes north with these ten tribes. But here it is in verse 36, just like we read in 2 Kings 8. But to his son I will give one tribe that my servant David may have a lamp always before me in Jerusalem, the city where I have chosen for myself to put my name. I mean, there's even going to be a new Jerusalem in the, in the uh, eternal state. So God is very focused on Jerusalem. I think a week from today in the second hour, we're going to look at Jerusalem a little more specifically. I think that's in order. For the sake of the Davidic covenant, therefore, God will not destroy Judah in the time of the evil reign of Jer uh, Jehoram, even though they're definitely worthy of it. So two things I see, God is gracious and God honors his word. He always keeps his promises, they always come true. Which tells me if he's promised us eternal life, eternal security and things like that, these very important truths, will he keep his word? Now, he's not going to change his mind on that. He doesn't change his mind on any promise he's made for sure that will come to pass and um, he will keep them. So 2 Kings 8.20 now, now we come, as we close this out, we come to the revolts of Edom and Libna under Jehoram's reign. Now, that ought to send a red flag up because why is there any revolt from nations under a reign of a Jewish king? Okay, that, I mean, that's got to be a problem. So verse 20, in his days, Edom revolted under the hand of Judah and made a king for themselves. So remember, Edom had helped Israel and Judah in their campaign against King, remember, Mesha of Moab back in 2 Kings 3. But now in Jehoram's day, Edom rebelled and set up its own king. <clears throat> then 821, then Joram, now you got to watch the names because sometimes Joram is called Jehoram. So then Joram crossed over Zaire, some say it's uh, Seir with an S, the name for Edom. So he crossed over and all his chariots with him. So a Jewish king is going against this rebellion. And he rose by night and struck the Edomites who had surrounded him and the captains of the chariots. But his army fled to their tents. So what just happened? Jehoram's army assembles, but they failed to be successful and they flee back to their tents. So now they're not even having victory over the Gentile enemy. So Edom, verse 22, revolted against Judah to this day. Then Libna, here's another one, then Libna revolted at the same time. Uh, one writer said of Libna, Libna was located southwest of Jerusalem near the border of Philistia. Its rebellion seems to have been precipitated by Philistine influence. The Philistines invaded Judah in Jehoram's day and Judah suffered heavy losses at their hands. 2 Chronicles 21, 16, and 17. So again, you can go to Chronicles sometimes and get some uh, extra information. So again, there's revolt by the nations around them, and they're, suffer they're suffering heavy casualties in these battles. And then we see the common phrase at the end of a reign of a king. It says in verse 23, The rest of the acts of Joram and all that he did, are they not written in the book of Chronicles of the kings of Judah? So this non-extant literature that had this information. So Joram slept with his fathers and was buried with his fathers in the city of David. And Ahaziah, his son, became king in his place. So again, we got another king replacing, replacing him. Do you ever read in the future prophecies, Jesus ruled for a hundred years, did evil in the sight of the Lord, and a new king took his place? You'll never find it. Because he's the perfect ruler who will never sin and he'll rule forever. No problems under him. So another thing I want to highlight in this chapter as we close today. <clears throat> I've already done it a little bit here. But notice that Edom and Libna revolted against Judah. And, and I thought, well, what is this word revolt? So here's the word. <clears throat> the Hebrew word for, do you have revolt? 
uh, in eight, uh, 2 Kings 8, 22? Did anyone have rebel? I'm just kind of curious. So rebel, uh, revolt. Well, it's the word uh, pasha in Hebrew, uh, P-A-S-H-A. Now, this word means to rebel, to transgress. So it is a word for sin, uh, to rebel, to transgress, or revolt. So the fact that there's a revolt in the land against Judah, the capital city in the south, shows the reader that things aren't, aren't the way they should be for God's people. Again, something's amiss. So what's amiss? Israel's revolt against God. So the word revolt in and of itself is covenant violation for Israel. And the fact that their nation's in revolt against God's people and nations actually victorious over them in these battles is also a sign that the nation is in covenant violation. So let me show you a few key places where this word shows up, just a few out of many. When you get to the time of Isaiah <clears throat> and also the prophet Ezekiel, they use the word against the Israelites. So Isaiah, what a wonderful book. I think what we'll end up doing when I get past 2 Kings, I'm going to wait to look at Chronicles at the end of Old Testament history. And I'm going to probably go to the prophets and then maybe start with Isaiah and just hit some high points in some of the passages in Isaiah. I probably will not do the whole book verse by verse. But hit some high points about the Messiah and the kingdom and, and Israel's need to return to God and so forth. But the Isaiah chapter 1 is a, is a chapter devoted to Israel's rebellion. It sets the problem out before the, the reader right away. So verse 2, it says, Isaiah 1, 2, Listen, o, uh, o heavens, and hear, O earth, for the Lord speaks. Sons I have reared and brought up, but they have revolted against me. So in our passage, we have revolt from the nations against Israel, but aren't they also in revolt against God? So there's the word pasha in Isaiah 1-2. Even later, Ezekiel the prophet will say in Ezekiel 2-3, He said to me, Son of man, I'm sending you to the sons of Israel, to a rebellious people who have rebelled against me. They and their fathers have transgressed against me to this very day. So the word transgressed is pasha. So Israel's covenant violation in two, prophets, or, uh, two uh, different chapters of the prophets. Now, let's um, back up a little because who are the two prophets? Well, who are the prophets to the north in the time of our study of kings? How many prophets can you name to the north? Elijah, Elisha, there's two more that I've already told you this morning. Amos and Hosea. That's why I think when, you, when you're reading one of the prophets, who were they ministering to? It's very important. So Hosea is a pre-exilic prophet to the north, and look what he says at the time we're studying in 2 Kings. <coughs> or in just I'm going to just say Kings because <coughs> it was one scroll in the Hebrew Bible. But listen to what he said in Hosea 7.13. Woe to them, for they have strayed from me, God says. Destruction is theirs, for they have rebelled against me. So there's that word for revolt. I would redeem them, but they speak lies against me. So God is allowing revolt even from the nations to go against his own people. But if they would return to him, he would give them victory. Hosea 8.1 Put the trumpet to your lips, and like an eagle, the enemy comes against the house of the Lord. Because, why? Israel. Because they have transgressed my covenant. I mean, there, you, know, you wonder why they say covenant violation? There it is. They have violated or transgressed the covenant and rebelled against my law. So the law is the law of Moses. What's that in parallel with in 8.1? My covenant. So it's the Mosaic covenant. It's the temporary covenant. Jeremiah 31, 31 through 34 speaks of a new covenant, but within that, he said, it's not like the covenant that I made with them at Mount Sinai that they broke, though I was a husband to them. So they broke the Mosaic covenant, but a new covenant will one day come 
in the future under the rule of Christ. <clears throat> so the pre-exilic prophet Hosea uh, makes it very clear they're, they're rebelling against the Lord. Uh, turn to Amos. <clears throat> Since you didn't give me the answer, Amos, I'll make you turn there. So Amos is one of the pre-exilic prophets to the north in I want to go to chapter 4. I call this the great shuv chapter in the prophets. There's a very concentrated collection <clears throat> of statements, yet you have not returned to me, declares the Lord. And returned is the word what? Shuv, the verb. Remember Deuteronomy 30, if Israel returns to God, he'll return to them. And that keeps going on and on and on through the prophets. It goes to the life of Jesus when John per tells Israel to repent and come back to God. Jesus does the same thing. Peter will do it in uh, Acts chapter 3, on and on. And one day they will. <clears throat> but in Amos 4, it gives a series of judgments from God to encourage Israel back to him. So God kept sending the prophets to warn them. But they wouldn't return. They wouldn't come back to covenant loyalty. So when you're in this chapter, each stanza of the chapter ends with the same. Yet you have not returned to me. You can see it in verse 6, verse 8, verse 9, verse 10, and verse 11. All these are shuv. That's why I say it's the shuv chapter because it really says it over and over and over. So let's just read it really quick. Amos 4.1, hear this word, you cows of Bashan who are on the mountain of Samaria. So where's Samaria? It's the northern kingdom. So he's ministering to them. And what does he accuse them of? Things in Torah that were violations of the covenant. Those who oppress the poor, you crush the needy, who say to your husbands, bring now that we may drink. But the Lord God has sworn by his holiness, behold, days are coming upon you when they will take you away with meat hooks and the last of you with fish hooks. So that's the enemy coming in and enslaving them. And who's going to be the, the enemy in the north? The wicked Assyrians who are going to enjoy doing this. Verse 3, you will go out through breaches in the walls, each one straight before her, and you will be cast to Harmon, declares the Lord. So enter Bethel and transgress. In Gilgal, multiply transgression. There's that word, that root, pasha. Bring your sacrifice every morning, your tithes every three days. Offer a thank offering from also which is leavened and proclaim freewill offerings and make them known. For so you love to do, sons of Israel, declares the Lord God. <clears throat> so they bring these sacrifices, but their heart's not with God. So what does he say? Look at the reference to famine. I gave you all cleanness of teeth in all your cities and lack of bread in all your places. So if your teeth, it didn't like it, he gave them toothbrushes and crest. Uh, there's nothing to eat, so there's nothing in their teeth. And I didn't give you bread at all. There's a lack of bread in all your places, so that's famine because without rain, there's no seeds growing into crops and no harvest. And then what does he say, though? What's the problem? Yet you have not returned to me. I'm trying to get your attention. So the plagues and everything he'd rained down on the nation, foreign powers coming in, drought, blight, mildew, all these things were designed to get Israel to come back. It was a sign of their divine discipline that they would come back if, if uh, they were wise. He's not just doing it to punish them because he hates them. Uh, remember when the prodigal son returns after the famine in Luke 15, what did the father do? Stay away, I was trying to kill you. No, he runs to him and hugs him and throws a banquet. So it was designed to get him back. So verse 7, furthermore, I withheld the rain. God withheld the rain from you while there was still three months until harvest. Then I would send rain on one city and on another city I wouldn't send rain. One part would be rained on while another part was dried up. So two or three cities would stagger to another city to drink water but would not be satisfied. So the point was to get them back, yet you have not returned to me, declares the Lord. So I smote you with scorching wind and mildew, and the caterpillar was devouring your many gardens and vineyards, fig trees and olive trees. So 
The little creatures are eating everything. You ever try to garden? Some people say the, the problem with gardening and trying to raise crops are all the bugs that eat everything. You just can't stop them. And then you've got to pour poison on all your plants to keep the bugs off. And then what does that do? I'm sure poison's really good for the soil. Uh, but you just see this, this difficulty. And God promised all of this exactly in the Torah, that there would be scorching wind, mildew, blight, uh, caterpillars eating their, their, their produce. Yet you have not returned to me, declares the Lord. Verse 10, so I sent plague among you after the manner of Egypt. I slew your young men by the sword along with your captured horses, and I made the stench of your camp rise up in your nostrils, yet you have not returned to me. I overthrew you as God overthrew Sodom and Gomorrah, and you were like a firebrand snatched from a blaze. You're almost completely destroyed, yet you have not returned to me, declares the Lord. Therefore, thus, <clears throat> thus I will do to you, O house of Israel. So in other words, I'm going to punish you. Because I will do this to you, prepare to meet your God, O Israel. Sounds like that common phrase, prepare to meet your maker. So prepare to meet your God, O Israel, that's judgment. For behold, he who forms mountains, look how God describes himself. The one who forms mountains and creates the wind and declares to man what are his thoughts. Didn't he just do that, declared what the thoughts would be of that evil king that killed Ben-Hadad? And I think Elijah, Elisha knew that this guy was going to do this, so he feigned, what do you mean I'm going to do all this? And he knows all the thoughts of men. So he declares to man, what are his thoughts? Who makes dawn into darkness and treads on the high places of the earth. The Lord God of hosts is his name, Yahweh Sabaoth. So we have all this rebellion, Israel's experiencing it from the nations, they're in rebellion and that's why they're getting it from the nations. So who's going to die for this rebellion of Israel? Thank you, Jesus Christ. And here the word even shows up, this word pasha for rebellion or transgression shows up with Jesus in the great chapter Isaiah 53 where Jesus dies on the cross for the sins of the world and definitely Israel. Isaiah 53, 12, therefore, I will allot him a portion with the great. This is God the Father allotting the Messiah a portion with the great. And he'll divide the spoil with the strong because he, Messiah, poured out himself to death, that's on the cross, and was numbered with the transgressors. There's that root pesha, pasha, the, the verb. Yet he himself bore the sins of many and interceded for the transgressors. So here Jesus is actually interceding as a substitute sacrifice um, for the sins of the people. So even though Israel is a people who transgress, Jesus will bear their transgression. Therefore, that makes the kingdom possible. But Israel is still required to confess their rebellion, which will result in their restoration in the promised land under Christ the King. The fulfillment of the Davidic covenant to which God always remains faithful, as we just heard. He'll always have a light in Judah, in Jerusalem. So does Israel, even though Messiah has paid for their transgression, I think even believing Israel, if they believe in Christ, they still have to confess that transgression for the restoration in the land. Jeremiah 3.12, God tells Jeremiah to tell the nation, go and proclaim all these words toward the north and say, return, shuv, or shuvu, and then faithless Israel, meshuvah Yisrael. So it's a command to return to God, just like, didn't Hosea say it? I'm, I'm sorry. Um, Amos say it over and over in Amos 4. Well, now Jeremiah is saying it. Return, faithless Israel, or backsliding Israel, declares the Lord, and then I will not look upon you in anger, for I am gracious, declares the Lord, and I won't be angry forever, but only acknowledge your iniquity, verse 13, that you have transgressed, there's the word pasha, you have transgressed against the Lord God and have scattered your favors to the strangers under every green tree and have not obeyed my voice, declares the Lord. Then I'll just jump you to Jeremiah 33, 8 at the bottom. 
of that slide. So in the future, God says, I'll cleanse them from all their iniquity by which they have sinned against me, and I'll pardon all their iniquities by which they've sinned against me and by which they have transgressed, there it is, Pasha, against me. So they got to confess it, and then one day there's going to be a, a national pardon or forgiveness for Israel. And then they'll be under the new covenant one day when this happens in the future under the rule of Jesus. So in the kingdom, there is going to be a national restoration after Israel confesses their rebellion and returns to God. Um, go to Zephaniah 3. The word shows up there too. <clears throat> it brings up Israel's rebellion, but also the future restoration under the King Jesus Christ. So let's turn there so we can read a few of these verses. Zephaniah 3, I'll give you a minute. Everybody get there? Look at Zephaniah 3.11. So the, the shame will be removed of their rebellion because they've confessed it. So he says, in that day, you'll feel no shame because of all your deeds by which you have rebelled against me. There's that word, Pasha. For then I will remove from your midst your proud, exulting ones, and you will never again be haughty on my holy mountain. So remember, if you exalt yourself, you'll be humbled. But if you humble your, yourself, you'll be exalted. That's what's going on here. But I'll leave among you a humble and lowly people, and they will take refuge in the name of the Lord. I think this will happen in the future kingdom under Christ. The remnant of Israel will do no wrong and tell no lies, nor will a deceitful tongue be found in their mouths. Is that happening today? I don't think so. For they will feed and lie down with no one to make them tremble. Boy, do a study of that phrase. When Israel's in the kingdom in the land under Jesus, there is no one to make them afraid anymore. Verse 14, shout for joy, O daughters of Zion, shout in triumph, O Israel, result, excuse me, rejoice and exult with all your heart, O daughter of Jerusalem. The Lord has taken away his judgments against you. He has cleared away your enemies. Are we seeing that in 2 Kings? No, the enemies are everywhere and they're revolting against and rebelling against even God's people. So are they at a time when there's no one around to make them afraid? No. Nah. Not till Zephaniah chapter 3. So the Lord has taken away all his judgments against you and has cleared away your enemies. The king of Israel, the Lord, is in your midst. So who's the king of Israel? I think it's Jesus Christ. And what is he called? Yahweh. It's the sacred tetragrammaton. He is the Lord, our righteousness, from Isaiah, uh, so, sorry, Jeremiah 23, 5 and 6. So he's ruling as king. He is Yahweh, the name that only belongs to God alone. And notice he's in your midst. It doesn't say he's inside your heart. Uh, the Kerbek is the Hebrew way. could be inside, but sometimes it just means in your midst. So the king will be in the midst of his people ruling in Jerusalem. And you'll f fear disaster no more. So this has to be this final restoration. And that day it will be said to Jerusalem... So there's this holy city. Don't be afraid, O Zion. Don't let your hands fall limp. For the Lord your God is in your midst, a warrior who saves. So Jesus is now called Yahweh Elohim. He's in the midst of his people, ruling in Jerusalem. He's called a warrior who delivers. Where did he deliver Israel? At the second coming from the enemy. The one covered in blood, the one who comes from Basra, just splattered in blood, Isaiah 63, 1 through 4. That's the same one who treads the great winepress of the fierce wrath of God Almighty in Revelation. And he returns to establish the kingdom for Israel, and he'll be in the midst of his people in Jerusalem on the throne of David on earth. And what will he do at that time? It says, he'll exult over you with joy. So the Messiah is going to rejoice over his people. And didn't the father rejoice when the prodigal son came back? It's the same pattern. So he's going to rejoice over the whole nation. He'll be quiet in his love. 
and he'll rejoice over you with shouts of joy. That's going to be a great day. Is that happening in Jerusalem now? Not even close. Is there a temple right now? Nope. <laughs> Hadn't even rebuilt the one for the tribulation, and the millennial temple will definitely be built. And when you see the description of that in Ezekiel 40 through 48, there's nothing close to that on that temple mount now. Is Jesus on earth ruling on David's throne? Is Jerusalem in peace right now? No, there's just a lot of missiles pointing to him right now. Uh, so all this is going to change dramatically. So clearly the rebellion in Israel will one day end when they're restored. And I'll bring up one more scripture, and that's the last one I got. Remember the prophecy of Daniel 9, 24 through 27. Remember it prophesied a 490-year period starting from a specific date that will be a 490-year period to complete God's kingdom program. So it starts, my view is that it started in 454 B.C. Some say 444 B.C. Uh, a decree made at, um, by Artaxerxes to Nehemiah in Nehemiah chapter 2, verses 1 through 8 to go back and re rebuild the city because it was in ruins. So if you start the date there, um, it says in verse 24, of Daniel 9, 70 sevens have been decreed for your people in your holy city. So Daniel's people are the Jews. The holy city is Jerusalem. So 70 times 7 is 490, right? So for when you start the decree, you count in 490 years and God's kingdom program will have come to pass. And so there's six things he said would happen within that 490 years. Um, to finish the transgression. You know what word that is? Pesha. That's our root for Israel's revolt, the revolt of the nations. Well, Israel's covenant violation will come to an end. The second thing, well, to make an end of sin. Three, to make atonement or cleansing for iniquity. Four, to bring in everlasting righteousness. Then to seal up vision and prophecy. And last, to anoint the most holy some say the most holy one. If that's the case, then Jesus will be anointed as king. If it's the most holy place, if that's the idea, then it would be Jerusalem, the temple uh, that's built there. So notice we, we have a 490-year period, uh, which, by the way, how many years have been fulfilled of that 490? 483, because that's when Jesus, it says the Messiah will be cut off and have nothing. It could be translated, not, but not for himself. So he'll be cut off, but he's not for himself. He's going to die for the sins of the people. So he'll die, but not for himself. He's not a sinner, but he'll die for the sins of the people. So that was the year 483 because he says 77s have been decreed, but before that time there's going to be um, 483 years in that math formula, and then Messiah will be cut off. So if he's cut off at year 483, and there's a total of 490, how many years do we need? Seven are left that haven't been fulfilled, which will be picked up in the tribulation when the Antichrist signs the covenant with Israel for 1-7, which is seven years, Daniel 9-27. The clock will begin, and then the last seven years of history will ensue. Then Daniel 9-24 will be fulfilled when all these six things come to pass at the second advent of Christ, and then his rule is established. So God's very specific in his prophecy. See, you can trust your Bible, right? You read the prophet Daniel and what God said through him and how perfectly accurate everything's come true. And that last seven years will happen as well. So that's it for this morning. <clears throat> Little preview. I always like to go ahead to where the blessing's going to finally ultimately come through Jesus because... I think that's encouraging as you're reading through Second, First, and Second Kings. So you just keep seeing perpetual failure. Is this ever going to end? I thank God for Bible prophecy to encourage us. Well, let's take a break. Father in heaven, we thank you for our time this morning, and we thank you for your word. We thank you for the truth that it gives us, and and the surety of our future, as related in prophecy. So we see the dismal failure of men, and along the way some success. But none of us are you. None of us are qualified to rule like your, your son who is God who becomes flesh. And so, Lord, we, we wait for his rule with great anticipation. 
And we also see the need for us to shine the light of Christ in our day in the church as uh, we give the gospel to the lost and then grow to spiritual maturity so that we can faithfully represent you until the time for us to leave this life comes. So, Father, bring us back next week to continue in our study of Second Kings, and we'll ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.